All right, so we're picking up with the um, digestive system, and I want to talk about the nervous system innervation of the digestive system. So the nervous system, the, the tube, has multiple layers, and there are different layers that um, receive input from the nervous system and help to control things like the smooth muscle function. This smooth muscle function clearly is going to be under autonomic nervous system control because you don't have to think about digesting your food. You don't have to think about moving these smooth muscles. Uh, and so you actually have nerves that come into the, uh, to the digestive tract with both a parasympathetic pressure and a sympathetic pressure. And as these neurons come in, to the to the different layers, the different smooth muscle layers of the nerve of the um, digestive tract, you have that extrinsic nerve fiber that innervates a plexus, and it's it's a kind of a spider web of nerves that surround and, and innervate all of the smooth muscle that's in uh, in the in the tract itself or in the the wall of the, of the digestive tract. Extrinsic nerve fibers innervate these plexuses. And you can kind of see that here. It's shown in light yellow, so it might be a little bit uh, difficult to see. But you have a nerve, so I'll trace one here with my finger. You have this nerve fiber that comes in. And then you can see that it branches out into like this web of, of nerves that interact with the smooth muscle. We bind these plexes or plexuses between the different layers of muscle. And really, they're going to have two that are, uh, that are uh, present in the smooth muscle. And it turns out that these two control different aspects of the digestive process. Okay? So, Between the muscle layer, we have what's known as the myenteric plexus of Auerbach. You're laughing because you think I'm making this up. That's in paper text, right? It's named after the, the individual who first characterized this particular plexus. So this is between the muscle layers. The myenteric, that's supposed to be a C at the end, myenteric plexus of Auerbach. This is what controls smooth muscle to create the peristaltic wave. If we go to the submucosal layer, which is actually on uh, the inside here, we will find actually a second, um, a second plexus. <laughs> and this is going to be referred to as the submucosal plexus of Meisner. Again, another epinephrine uh, individual who discovered this. So the Auerbach controls peristalsis. The Meisner, the plexus, the Meisner plexus is going to 
actually innervate and control the fill eye. And so they will actually uh, use the, the submucosal plexus as visor to um, aid in the absorptive process uh, in, inside of the digestive tract. So peristalsis from Auerbach, Meisner controlling the villi's function. Okay, so with that kind of introduction um, to the, the digestive system and how we um, control the movement and how we control the digestive process or the absorptive process, I should say, I want to now talk through our GI hormones. And in particular, I want to start out with the synthesis of our GI hormones. So within the tissue, we have a group of cells within the digestive system's tissue. We have a group of cells that are called enterochromaffin cells. And several of our GI hormones are produced within this particular cell type. Sometimes these enterochromaffin cells are referred to as the clear cells. And we actually don't find them located in specific groups. We find these individual cells scattered throughout the tissue. So this clear cell is scattered throughout the tissue. We're going to find uh, these cells all along the tract, starting in the stomach, leading to the colon. And then we have a layer of tissue that's known as the mucosa, which is really what forms the luminal wall of the uh, of the digestive tract that is going to be the, the home for these enterochromaffin or these clear cells that are found in that mucosal layer. Now what is kind of interesting here is that actually means that these cells that produce our GI hormones, they actually are going to be on the surface of the, uh, the gut lumen. And so they interact with that surface as well as with the surrounding tissue. So it's not a real clear picture here. Um, let me go ahead. I'll, I'll increase the size here just for a moment. So these are kind of the folds that we find all along the um, all along the digestive tract. So this is what makes up the wall. And we have several different types of cells. What we're focused on right now is this ECL cell. This is the enterochromaffin cell or the clear cell. Uh, and you can see, so this is lumen here. This is the luminal wall. And the cells are just kind of located throughout the entire uh, entire leg from stomach down to the colon. And they have one surface that actually interacts out here with the, the lumen of the, uh, of the stomach and the intestine. Now we actually can take these enterochromaffin cells and we can break them up or divide them up even further based off of the type of hormone that they primarily produce. So we have several different kinds. And the first is the D cells. And the D cells produce a hormone called somatostatin. The 
the second kind <clears throat> is going to be the G cell, and the G cell produce the hormone gastrin. Third is the S cells. which is secretin. And then we have two different, uh, two different additional molecules that are also produced within these cells, not specifically from any given cell. So you'll find these three types of hormones being produced, plus then two additional uh, two different additional molecules. One is substance P, the other is 5-HT, you'll know 5-HT is serotonin, that are also produced from our different variants of our clear cells. Uh, our clear cells. Now, as we start to look at the GI hormones, they actually can be divided up into a couple different classes. I'm going to give you two major classes. The first major class is the gastrin hormone family. The gastrin hormone family. Included in the gastrin hormone family is clearly going to be gastrin is one of them, but then also CCK, the cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin. The second class. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I go on, this first class. The reason they are grouped together is because gastrin and CCK share the first five amino acids in their sequence. The second class is the secretin hormone family. Uh, this includes the hormone secretin. This is also where we find the hormone glucagon. We also have a hormone here called vasoactive intestinal peptide. And then also gastric inhibitory peptide. And the commonality that we here have here in the secretin family. So here is um, secretin, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and glucagon. This is the amino acid sequences. We also have uh, GPL1 and GPL2. Uh, listed on here as well. Uh, you can ignore that for now. I want you to focus up here uh, on the top. And what you're going to see is that you have uh, many of the same amino acids that are shared between these different molecules. Any place that you have kind of the vertical lines here is where it's shared between those individuals. Any place you have under uh, the underlines is the bottom and the top are shared. Okay, so many of the same amino acids in these um, different hormones within the secretion hormone family. Now, outside of these two hormone families, we also have other, or what I'm going to refer to as ancillary hormones. 
ancillary hormones and peptides. In these ancillary hormones and peptides, we have several other gut peptides that exist. And mostly what we know about these other gut peptides, mostly what we know is that um, they have function in gut, uh, in, in, in gut physiology, maybe digestion, maybe um, movement. And so we're calling them ancillary hormones and peptides because we know some of the function, but they may also eventually achieve or be uncovered as true hormones as well. And so they may eventually achieve, achieve hormone status with additional research. And so here's just kind of a rundown of all these different molecules that we have that are associated in some way with the digestive system. Uh, and so we know about CCK, and you can see that it's involved in gallbladder contraction, squeezing out um, the, the solution from the gallbladder, helps out with uh, lipid digestion, it's involved in intestinal motility, uh, functions in the pancreatic exocrine, or the part of the pancreas that's outside of exocrine function, helps out with secretion. So you have all of these different molecules. Some of them are hormones. Some of them, like motilin here, has been shown to be involved in gastrointestinal motility, but that's on a paracrine rather than an endocrine level. But motilin may end up in the bloodstream and target other tissues or other parts of the um, digestive system itself. Okay, and so then you have ghrelin and gastrin. We're not talking a whole lot about the pancreatic hormones just yet. We're going to pick up with those in, in chapter um, number 10, chapter 11, chapter number 11. Um, but a lot of these have uh, some responsibility in digestive physiology as well. And then you got a couple others, GLP-1 and 2, um, and, and some other molecule substance P down there at the bottom that may or may not have hormone function. So let's start to talk about individual molecules and what we know about them. Take a look at their physiological roles. And let's go ahead and start with the hormone gastrin. So we're going to start with gastrin. So gastrin is going to originate in the mucosal cells of the antral region. The antrum is at the base of the stomach. Okay, So we're going to find uh, cells here that produce gastrin. Uh, in the stomach, and then also in the mucosal cells of the duodenum, the upper portion of the antral. Yep. The duodenum is the upper portion of the small intestine. Okay, so the mucosal lining, again, is that inner part of the, um, of the uh, digestive tract. And so we have cells here at the antrum of the stomach and then leading into the small intestine. Now gastrin has a couple different actions. The mucosal cells, they actually will produce and release gastrin directly into the lumen of the digestive system. Molecules that act in this way. They don't enter the bloodstream. They enter directly into the lumen. So these are called luma, lumones. It's kind of an amalgamation of luma, lumen and hormone. And so the lumones enter the gastric juice in the lumen. Release 
released from the apical side of the cell. <laughs> okay, so gastrin enters the gastric juice from that apical side of the cell and has action inside of the lumen. But we also will release from the basal side of the cell, which will end up putting gastrin into the extracellular fluid surrounding the cells, and then will get picked up into the blood and will act as a true hormone. So that hormone action here starts with gastrin entering circulation. from the basal side or the basal surface of its coastal cell. So we basically have gastrin going in two directions from the cell to act as a lumon and to act as a hormone. And it's kind of process here, once it enters into the bloodstream, is to um, is to function as a, um, a satiety hormone. Basically, a hormone that is going to help to indicate the uh, the, the feeding or hunger level of an organism. Okay, so how is it actually released? Uh, the release modality or the way that it's released, uh, it's actually going to be released in a few different ways. The first way is for there to be vagus nerve stimulation. So vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. It runs to a variety of different visceral organs and will interact with places like the antrum and the duodenum and will cause release of gastric. This is a minor control mechanism, however. The primary way in which gastrin is released is through the ingestion of food. So when you consume a meal, you have a variety of different molecules that come into the digestive system. And there are three in particular that have an effect on releasing or causing the release of gastric. The first is the presence of peptide fragments. So you consume, let's say, a hamburger that meat has amino acids in it or has peptide chains in it, and as that hamburger comes through the mouth and the stomach, it's being broken up mechanically and chemically, and then it'll enter into the antrum or the bottom of the stomach in the duodenum, and there'll be peptide fragments, basically broken up pieces of protein that will become uh, nutritively available in those, in those two um, digestive regions. that will result in the release of gastric. The presence of individual amino acids will have a similar effect. And then the presence of free fatty acids will also have a effect on the release of gastric. So that's one of the primary mechanisms a second primary mechanism, gastrin begins to be released in a process that's known as food anticipation. Food anticipation. So as you get closer to a meal, and most of us, 
turn it on and back in. Yes. There we go. Most of us eat on a relatively routine schedule. And so as you get closer and closer to that anticipated meal time, we may actually see gastrin levels begin to increase kind of in anticipation of, of that meal. And then the last stimuli for release of gastrin is distension of the stomach. Distension of the stomach. So if you kind of are looking through this, gastric levels are going to begin to increase in the blood when you're thinking about a meal, when you've just consumed that meal, and especially when that meal contains higher level amino acid, peptides, and fatty acids. So the overall function here, overall functions of gastric. So here are my G cells. Remember, I do have gastrin that gets released into the lumen, but I also have from the basal side gastrin that gets released, and it gets picked up uh, into the bloodstream, and it targets a couple different places. We target places like the beta cells of the pancreas and cause differentiation and regeneration. So basically prime those cells to be more efficient releasers of insulin. The um, ECL cells, which are a cell in the, uh, in the digestive system, will target the ECL cells and release a molecule called histamine. And then both histamine and gastrin themselves will interact with a second cell type that we have in the lumen of the digestive system called the parietal cells. And you can see that we produce this molecule called HCL, which you all know as hydrochloric acid. That actually makes a whole lot of sense that we begin to load the stomach up with hydrochloric acid when we have proteins that are present or amino acids that are present, because that's one of the ways that we can denature those proteins so that we can begin to chop those up to go through that chemical digestion process. So our main functions here, we have that kind of biochemical cellular pathway that leads towards the stimulation of hydrochloric acid. We're also going to stimulate some um, proteins or enzymes that are involved in protein digestion. In particular, one of those is called pepsinogen. Pepsinogen. So in the presence of gastrin, pepsinogen activity increases. And the summary here for function is that gastrin prepares the organism for protein digestion. Yeah. So gastrin, the protein digestion hormone, both release of hydrochloric acid, which denatures protein, and the upregulation of this enzyme called pepsinogen to allow the breakup or the breakdown of protein into individual amino acids. The next hormone I want to talk through is, is secrete. So you kind of have a little bit of a crude model here of the stomach that will contain high levels of hydrochloric acid. That's our stomach acid. We've got the pancreas here with the blood supply and the, and the duct system. And then we have a length of small intestine. Okay? So secretin. is going to be involved in the regulation of small intestine pH. The stomach can survive high levels of hydrochloric acid because you have a mucosal lining over that, over that, uh, over that tissue. And so as hydrochloric acid is released into the stomach, 
the stomach remains protected and doesn't denature its own proteins because of that mucosal layer. But that mucosal layer actually disappears as you move into the small intestine. And so you think about the release of that bolus. We've now talked through some of this. The release of that bolus that comes into the small intestine, it is going to be a low pH bolus because there's going to be incorporated hydrochloric acid. So we need to be able to change that pH in order to protect the small intestine as we move through the duodenum, the jejunum, and the So secretin is actually going to be involved in this regulation of, uh, of pH. Now, this mechanism is, is a little bit strange. It's known as a homeostatic closed loop endocrine mechanism. Homeostatic closed loop endocrine mechanism. So basically, we have to be able to sense the pH as uh, in the uh, in the small intestine and respond appropriately if pH is too low so that we protect the integrity of the duodenum in the small intestine. So secretin is not released, <clears throat> not released at a pH of about four and a half or higher, four and a half. But if we drop below that, we stimulate this closed loop circuit where we sense the hydrochloric acid and the pH change, resulting in a release of that hormone to now be distributed into the, uh, into the intestinal lumen. Okay, so where does hydrochloric acid come from? It actually comes from the middle section of the stomach. This is the antrum of the stomach. This is called the fundus, or the body, and then because this is up towards the heart, this is called the cardia. So it's actually the fundus that is primarily responsible for the body of the stomach, the fundus of the stomach that produces the acid. <laughs> And we are basically producing hydrochloric acid. If you remember back to chemistry, what kind of acid is hydrochloric acid, by the way? Yes, it's a strong acid, right? And so when hydrochloric acid is released from the fundus, we have an increase in hydrogen ions, which promotes digestion. And the big thing that happens here is we denature molecules in the presence of the high, the heightened uh, hydrogen concentration, which results in decreased pH. And this is what enters the duodenum. Now, the stomach is protected. The duodenum is not. And so as the duodenum begins to interact with this high hydrogen concentration, low pH, solution from the stomach, we begin to have this secretin mechanism that gets turned on. So in the presence of low pH, secretin is going to be released from our S cells, from the S cells. They are actually going to be released not into the lumen, but enter into the bloodstream. They circulate and target the pancreas. Secretin, when it targets the pancreas, it's actually targeting the exocrine part of the pancreas. That's not the, the, the iris, right? This is the other tissue. It's called the pancreatic acinar tissue. So it targets the acinar cells and begins to promote the production and the release of biocarbon. Okay. 
Okay, so we begin to release bicarbonate. And just to give you a reminder of the chemical, uh, the chemical formula for bicarbonate, it's HCO3 and it has that single negative charge. Under normal conditions, it's ionized. In the presence of lots of hydrogen, it can pick up that hydrogen. So as hydrogen enters into the duodenum, secretin is released into the bloodstream, targets the pancreas, the pancreas, um, the astenar tissue, the exocrine portion of the pancreas begins to release this bicarbonate, which is an acceptor of hydrogen. Hydrogen begins to be pulled out of, uh, out of the solution coming in. And you'll notice that we have this duct that comes in here. This is called the common bile duct or the pancreatic duct. Really, this is the common bile duct here. This is the... Um, this will be the, the duct that runs up to the gallbladder. This is the duct that runs out of the pancreas. We begin to produce bicarbonate, and it makes its way in here through this op small little opening. It's about three or four inches, and most of us uh, down from the uh, pyloric sphincter into the small intestine. So we begin to experience high levels of hydrogen here. We release bicarbonate. That bicarbonate begins to pick up the hydrogen. pH begins to go back. And so we end up with a neutralization of the acid. I'm going to go ahead and stop there, and we'll pick up with uh, our next hormone.